afternoon. Um, I'm an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Um, I have a laboratory at McLean Hospital, and I co-direct the Institute for Technology and Psychiatry. So I organized year one's meeting, uh, so it's very pleasant to just be a participant and have uh, Ipsit Vahia on the hook for the rest of it. Um, so yeah, so my basic uh, work is a um, digital research platform where people participate in studies that are publicly available in return for their research results. <clears throat> I'm Roscoe Brady. I'm an assistant professor of psychiatry. I'm based over at uh, Beth Israel Hospital down the street. You know, my research focus is actually not uh, in digital psychiatry per se, but I do uh, neuroimaging research. We're trying to find basically brain circuit basis for psychotic disorder uh, symptoms and deficits, and then try to you know basically uh, ameliorate those deficits and symptoms using uh, neuromodulation. And uh, I think one of the reasons I'm here on the panel today is, you know, all the research we do is human participant research and in participants with severe mental illness and participants who are actually, you know, ill at the time of participating in research. So we do neuroimaging research on inpatient units and other places where basically by, uh, by definition we need people to come into, the, uh, come into the study symptomatic but able to participate in informed consent. And like basically navigating that is, you know, it's uh, led me to interact with Benji a number of times over the years. And, uh, you know, we've been thinking about these kinds of questions for a while. Hello, uh, I'm Robert Schleitman. I'd like to uh, reassure you that IRB members are not all bureaucrats who have uh, <laughs> memorized regulations, but that we're mo most of us have been clinicians or researchers. My own work has been quantitative work in uh, radiation dosimetry and imaging, and then later uh, qualitative uh, and mixed methods uh, work in, in health policy. Uh, but we, we've all um, had to uh, struggle with grant writing, with uh, uh, enrollment targets, with uh, having our own submissions redlined by the IRV, so we, we, we understand where you're coming from. Um, I was a fairly uh, new IRV chair when uh, MGH and McLean uh, merged, and I've uh, since come to really appreciate uh, the breadth and scope of mental health and behavioral research. And with uh, Dr. Silverman's and McLean scientists' uh, expertise, uh, I'm still learning the nuances. Uh, my name is James Wilkins. I'm an inpatient geriatric psychiatrist at McLean Hospital, working uh, primarily with uh, patients with advanced dementia and, and significant behavioral symptoms. Um, I'm a former bioethics fellow uh, across the street at the Center for Bioethics and worked with Benji and, and Robert on the IRB panel in the past. Uh, my research is mostly focused on um, uh, surrogate decision making for people with dementia, how we think about uh, the informed consent process, both in sort of research and, and clinical processes, and, and how we can try to um, understand that and prove that, uh, uh, improve the fidelity there. Great. Great. Thank you, everyone. And then most importantly is you all. So you were part of this uh, panel and, and this discussion, so uh, I encourage you to participate as much as you can. I'm going to guide some of that participation, and feel free to, to chime in. Um, so the ground rules, be respectful, let's not try, try not to interrupt each other. You're welcome to interrupt us, I think, but don't interrupt each other. Uh, ask questions, answer questions. I think it's always important in an ethics talk to, to underscore, especially because I'm going to be doing some polling, that consensus does not equal correctness. So we could all be wrong, basically. Uh, and we will try to give some advice along the way. Um, the disclaimer that is important here, uh, so, so none of us have any formal conflicts of interest. I think it is important to say that anything we say is really just our own opinions, not our organizations or our employers. We may also just take positions for the sake of dev being devil's advocate or to stimulate discussion. It might not even be what we actually believe. Uh, the cases are all anonymized and generalized, and any data that we collect in the polling here is 100% anonymous. So. Okay, this is where you guys get to get involved. So, um, so you can do this in one of two ways. You can either take your phone and go to a web browser and go to pollev.com, P-O-L-L-E-V.com, and then enter in, uh, it's Benji, B-E-N-J-Y-S 700, and follow along that way, or you can join by text, by texting uh, to 22333, the same Benji S 700. So, why don't you guys take a second to do that, and uh, we should be able to, oh, and I'm sorry, and then the question is, this is basically a prompt of what the title of the talk is, what makes clinical researcher work in digital psychiatry ethical? So we're asking for a word that comes to your mind, basically. So what's the first word that comes to your mind when you, you ask the question of what, what do you think makes this type of work ethical? 
Uh, so we'll give it a second. We can see on the bottom there's three results so far, and there's more than three people here. And Oh, and you guys should participate too. <laughs> I don't actually know how many people there are here. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. If your phones are not connecting, the HMS public Wi-Fi will allow it to connect. Um, and, if, and if it doesn't work out, it looks like it's working for some people. So I apologize if it's not working for everyone, but we'll do the best we can here. I think there's probably We have 25 results so far. I don't actually know how many people do you think are here. All right, so maybe, it seems like for most people this is working, so maybe I will go ahead and I'm gonna have to use my computer for this one. So, um, so this slide is supposed to show a word cloud of your responses. So there we go. Um, so this is what people, and it will continue to update as you do this. So it looks like transparency, privacy, respect, consent, um, interesting. I don't see anything terribly surprising in there. <laughs> Love the interaction of like the word cloud and what people are adding. I know, yeah. It's it, not. it may give me a headache, but that's okay. <laughs> um, any thoughts from the panel on the word cloud? I like that transparency is uh, coming. I wouldn't have, if I had to predict what was going to be the top word, yeah, I, I don't have think I would have gone with transparency, but that's interesting that that's the I one that's still. I would have expected still... privacy or Right, consent. right, yeah, but that's the, that's the well, okay, all right. You know, Good, okay, so part of this was just to get down. you guys set up, and so now if you logged in, or if, you, if you're using the website, if you leave that open, the question should automatically come up as I, as I go forward here. Um, and if you texted, you should just be able to continue to text, basically. So this one is, again, just another testing question to make sure that we're all, all connected here. How, have you ever attended this conference before, yes or no? Um, and, so, and the numbers next to the questions will help you answer uh, if you're texting. Um, so, okay. Oops, I show response. So, so actually, mostly uh, first-timers. Um, Okay, so again, that was, everybody got that down? So this is how we're gonna kind of go along here. So, uh, so just so that we know kind of who is here, uh, maybe we could just try to get a sense of um, what your role here is. If you're a clinician, researcher, administrator, um, I didn't include research staff or medical staff, but you can you know, pick, pick what you think fits the best. Uh, and here's our responses. So we've got, Decent amount of researchers, decent amount of trainees, um, some clinicians, some others. It's, it's a nice mix, which is kind of what I figured. Um, great. Okay, and so now we're gonna get into some cases. Uh, and so basically the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna present a case. I, the other disclaimer I should have said is I, I totally recognize that cases are limited and that uh, you know the devil is always in the details of these things. So when you're answering the questions, just make your best guesses, and we can talk about some of the nuances. So the first case and the first topic we're going to talk about is return of research results. So a research team works to develop a new method to diagnose depression, which includes completing cognitive questionnaires, brain imaging, blood work, genetic testing. Some of the measures collected are validated; others are investigational. The researchers hope to combine the collected data with medical record information to develop a predictive algorithm to predict the onset of depression. Subject A completes a standard structural MRI scan of a healthy control participant. Researchers identify a three centimeter lesion in the right frontal lobe. Subject B completes an investigational MRS sequence, again a healthy control, and, uh, and researchers identify a glutamate peak that uh, would typically be expected to be seen in, in depressed subjects. So the question is, um, what should be shared with the subject? Should subject A get the res his, uh, their results? Should subject B get their results? neither or both. So you guys answer, and while you're answering, I'm gonna turn this over to the panel to uh, discuss. Maybe, um, maybe Dr. Brady, you could start, since this one's kind of up your alley. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> it's a scenario which I think I'm familiar with, so I can speak to it a little bit. So I could say this, that um, you know, part of the consent process you know, for uh, participants um, who are under, gonna undergo an MRI, we actually do say explicitly in there that uh, 
you know, if we discover, you know, basically some sort of a, so an incidental finding that you know, may have clinical significance, <clears throat> that basically we're going to share that result, you know, with the individual and uh, even more language in there about what we're going to do to basically facilitate follow-up. You know, basically there is actually some, you know, basically an assumption that we're going to take some role as far as helping the person get the follow-up that would be, you know, indicated by what we saw there. So from my perspective, you know, subject A is someone that we'd let them know because even if we don't know what the prognosis is or the significance of that lesion, I think we have an agreement that, like, there is a certitude that it should be followed up with further evaluation. I would also say, you know, that actually subject B, that is probably not someone we'd share that result with because, and maybe I'm speaking this particular example, you know, there is actually not a consensus, you know, around basically what, like, an elevated glutamate level in some part of the brain indicates. Like that is to say, we don't know that, like, you know, what the false positive rate for something like that is. We don't know if that is a finding that's happening, you know, basically that's how to put this incidental, something that I'm doing as part of the procedure versus actually reflecting underlying biology. You just don't know how replicable the result is. Because there isn't an agreement, you know, about what findings like that, you know, basically indicate as far as follow-up, we actually don't typically, you know, share that kind of result with the participant. Thank you. Can I, I'd like to add to that, at least for subject A. I think that's universal, that uh, it's ethically important to, to disclose incidental findings of clinical relevance. But uh, what you said uh, uh, underscores the idea that the, the research team should really plan what they're going to do with, with uh, incidental findings, other findings, uh, whether they're at baseline or follow-up, uh, and then uh, also have that disclosed in the consent form. Um, so what I, what I heard was uh, ethically required to, you know, essentially follow up on something that we know what it means clinically um, or know it could be concerning clinically and having a plan in advance. Um, so let's, let's see what people said just to, um, so interesting. Uh, I said one of the benefits of this session was by having you guys interact. I, uh, some of these slides were easier to prepare. The harder part is having to think on my feet about what it means. <laughs> um, so I think what this means, and I'll be curious to hear what other people think, and, and I think the next question might get to this too, is you know, I, think there, I think there's a push towards wanting to share more, basically. I think there's a push in our field um, towards wanting to uh, return results, basically. And there's a lot of reasons for wanting to return results, potentially. Um, because I think, what, I think that, that what Dr. Brady described would be kind of like the traditional approach, basically. But I can see here that there's a lot of people that would think that, that both subjects should get that result back. Um, I don't know if anyone, anyone else want to say anything about this? Or? Are we going to have the audience speak at any point? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to hear from what someone in think? the audience yeah. that said both. You can go to the microphones. You can you Are can you submit questions to? or thoughts here if you want me to read them. Um. Yeah, Elisa Bush from McLean Hospital. So I was one of those who selected both because I feel like we should at least do something to inform that patient or that subject that they are perhaps at increased risk, or if, is there some plan for an assessment to screen the patient, for example, for depression, to see if they truly are um, perhaps at increased risk. I felt uncomfortable if we had results that we thought increased the risk of the patient having um, a disorder, that there should be some follow-up with the patient. You wouldn't say necessarily, I think you have depression, but I, I felt uncomfortable just leaving it like no, no information at all for the patient, or subject, I should say. Thank you, Elisa. So I come to this with some feeling because I, I used to uh, run the MRI Center at Columbia in the Department of Psychiatry and I sat on the IRV for these questions. And so the answer I was really looking for was it depends, you know, on what we'd agreed on with the subject. But, but the reason I put both was because my experience overwhelmingly in recruiting for, for subjects for MRI studies was they want to know and that a big part of the reason that they're volunteering is because they're curious. And my experience was that in general, and obviously there's exceptions to everything, patients could appreciate that we didn't have a conclusive answer, that it wasn't, you know, that if we saw a change in glutamate activity or so on, that, that, it, that it didn't mean they definitely had depression or that they were definitely going to have depression. 
but they were participating in the research because they were curious about what we were learning. And so as long as I think we can communicate in that way, it becomes a kind of partnership between researchers and subjects. And obviously we have to keep being clear about what it means and the caveats and all the rest, but that that's much more collaborative and that's where the field in general is going, away from hierarchy towards collaboration. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would say that in ethics, the answer is always it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I completely agree with that response, and the response I wanted to see was both, but presented differently, because I think that b um, both people might benefit from getting the results, but for very different reasons. I think person A really needs to know for their own medical information, it should be presented that way, as here's an issue of possible medical concern, whereas presenting that information to subject B that way would likely be the wrong approach, given that the method isn't validated and it might not end up meaning anything for them but they might benefit and appreciate being informed from the point of view uh, and with it very explicitly stated as this is for your own information so you can know what we know about what came out of this research. But we can't make any statements about what it means medically and we can't interpret it that way. So I think how you frame the return of research results makes a big difference. So Great. can Thank I... You. Um, what I was going to say was that it depend that in our current state of knowledge, the clinical assessment, which presumably this participant had, um, the one with the glutamate, is a better predictor of depression than the glutamate. So I'm assuming that if on the clinical assessment there was evidence that this person was depressed, et cetera, that would be revealed to the person. If you basically are presenting the glutamate as if we have an, as much knowledge about that as we do from the clinical assessment, you're actually misinforming the subject. And that's the argument for not, I think, for not informing the glutamate uh, subject. Right, thank you. Yes, I, I, I do think you're absolutely right. The argument to not return kind of a non-clinically validated result would be either that you'd be providing some sort of misinformation or that you would create anxiety where there doesn't need to be anxiety for someone going to get extra scans and follows up, follow up and things like that. I also agree that, right, it, it's probably somewhat rare that we'd be considering, and again, this is the limitation of a, a brief case that we'd be considering, uh, you know, a small piece of information in isolation, basically. Um, yeah. I mean, to, to address... Uh, I can't address every oh, and single. Can you just? Uh, I can't address every single comment at once. But but to you know, to pull, pull together a few of those things, um, you know, you can imagine a scenario, right? Which is basically, you know, these results. How to put this? They are derived from the individual participants' biology, right? They consented to be a part of the study. Had this information collected. You can imagine a scenario theoretically where actually, yeah, they are absolutely entitled, you know, basically to that data, but you know, a scenario where you basically are asked to give it back to them without any kind of context or interpretation, right? In the sense, simply that because uh, to address what was said, you know, by a colleague from Columbia originally, you know, yes, people, you know, will frequently participate in these studies and basically will right up front say, I want to learn more about myself. I want to learn more about my diagnosis. I want to learn about what's going on with my brain. And there is, you know, some imperative right up front to basically say, like, you know, I share your curiosity, but what we're going to be able to tell you about your brain, your diagnosis, your symptoms is so limited, right, that, like, I actually, you know, I, I, we need to find, think of some other kind of reasons, right, that you want to participate, because if that's it, you're going to be disappointed. I'm going to feel like I might have misled you. But you can imagine a scenario where basically at the end of, um, you know, I've had an MRI before as part of a research study, and I was given like a CD, you know, basically with an image of my brain with, you know, no interpretation, nothing, you know, oh, wow, you know, nice, nice soul sign gyre, nothing like that attached to it. You could imagine a scenario like that where basically you say, yes, you're entitled to it, but I absolutely can't tell you what it means because that would be outside the scope of what I know, what my study can tell you, and so on. Um, I, I have an answer to that, but I want to hear from the plenary. 
Yeah, hey. yeah. Let's, um, let's do one more audience on this I, one, I, then we'll... Yeah. So I'm a psychiatrist, and as a clinician, I would be very interested in knowing what the inclusion and exclusion criteria may be, because there could be a selection bias, just um, as you said before, people may decide to volunteer for a study like that because they want to know more, they know, want to know more maybe they're anxious, and then there could be a clinical implication with increased anxiety and increased um, seeking behavior of seeking um, help, and I think ethically, uh, this is something that needs to be uh, taken into consideration, and I'm sure subjects have to sign something when they sign up, and I wonder if um, this is something that they sign up for, um, the fact that they may have results and they may not know what they mean. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I just say one thing on that, which is we, we do usually require in a consent form whether or not results are going to be returned, so people would generally have that information up front. So um, I was a both person, uh, and so it's very validating to see the audience <laughs> come down the side of both. I didn't think it was going to go that way. But I think that, you know, I agree that it's, it's, we don't want to mislead people, and we don't want people to feel distressed when there's really no reason to feel distressed. But I do think that there's an onus on the research community to, to support public education. And one of the things that we can educate the public about better, as well as each other, is uncertainty. Um, there's uncertainty around any medical information that you receive. Um, for something like you know, the glutamate data, there's more uncertainty. And so being able to say, this is what we can infer from this data, and this is all the stuff we can infer, is actually a great moment for, for teaching a person about how to interpret medical data. And you can imagine, you know, five years from now, a major finding comes out on MRS glutamate signals that is indicative of a subtype of depression. And now that person knows from that study they were in five years ago, like, oh, wait, I should go get screened for this because I came up high that one time. So, I feel like, you know, it's, for me, the question shouldn't be about whether to return results, it should be about how. So, you know. Great, thank you. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so I was a, an A person, and, and I think that the, the way that I sort of thought about that is thinking about this, the differentiation between research and clinical care. And, and I think that that is, is, you know, Benji and Roscoe mentioned, what you sign up for on the consent is sort of clearly stating the risk and benefits of participation. And there may be sort of a curiosity motivating somebody's participation, you know, some altruism and things like that. But the goal of research is not to provide individual information. That's the role of clinical care. You know, so I think to be mindful of what is part of routine clinical care, and certainly an incidental finding on an MRI is, is of concern, you know, but when I read these slides, I had no idea what an MRS glutamate thing is, and, you know, I'm a primarily a clinician. And so I think being mindful of, of, of that discrepancy in approaching this uh, is thinking about what are the goals of research, how is that being communicated to uh, potential participants in a consent form, and, and using that to inform how we uh, disclose information and, and how that's used. So I, that doesn't really answer anything, but I think it, at least for me, clarifies a little bit about this balance between what are our goals as a clinician, what are our goals as, as a researcher and, and thinking about individual care versus, you know, the pursuit of, of generalized knowledge and, and finding that balance. Thank you. Um, so why don't we uh, just, I want to make sure we can get to all the cases. Uh, so, so this is the same research study, um, but now this is about the questionnaires that uh, people are filling out. So subject C is completing a SCID-5 and a research psychologist finds a diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder current. Uh, and subject D completes a, a, a computer-based behavioral task, something kind of like an implicit association test. You guys can um, imagine what the, the test might be. Uh, and, and a subject's identified as having a predisposition towards depressive thoughts. So the, the question is the same, which is uh, which results should be shared? So, so should subject C get results? Should subject D get results? Both or neither? Um, Say that once more. Oh, sure. This part, you mean? Yes, yes, yes. So, what's the panel think? Laura, do you want to weigh in? Well, you know, I'm going to be both. First, I know. I, I knew you were going to be a both person. <laughs> Why? Um, so, I think this is, again, another situation. I think in the first case, you know, it, a full skid was done, and so this is something where, you know, in a clinical setting, one would consider this a, 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 a very useful piece of information to have the patient know. In the second case, I think uh, this is one where, you know, educating people about implicit associations is actually really useful, and in many cases, you know, maybe it's not implicit associations, it's something else, but a moment where having the person engaged with something where they can learn about it 
in terms of general knowledge, but it, as something personally relevant too. So I think, again, it's these moments for educating people about the mind and brain, for educating people about themselves, but with all the caveats of presenting the information with you know, the appropriate degree of uncertainty and taking it as a moment to, to you know, share knowledge with the participants. So I'm all, I'm all in on both. I don't want to put you on the spot, but would you mind the, the caveats? Like I know you have thought a lot about this and um, could you talk about a little about like the caveats that you put when you share results? Yeah, with so I people? think, you know, there's a few important caveats to include. One is the fact of uncertainty, which, you know, mentioned. Um, the other is the fact that there are many reasons why someone might have a particular score some of which might be related to depressive thoughts, but it could be related to something about the context where something went wrong with their computer or they're pressing the wrong button or their child is shouting at them and so there's, you know, there's, a, there's an interruption that's causing them to change their behavior. Um, and then also talking about making it clear this is research and the purpose of research is to discover new knowledge and that means that the knowledge we have now might change radically um, at, by the conclusion of the study or in the next several years and so this is a you, you know piece of information that's uh, potentially um, uh, potentially useful, but really to take it with not a grain of salt, but like a like a large like refill box of salt that you pour into your salt shaker. Um, and I think then the person still can have that moment of of engagement, that moment of of learning, uh, and then also learn about the research process and and how to think about this sort of data. Why don't we see what people? Uh, interesting. So, so in this case, uh, it, you know, it, it's not an accident. These were written kind of the same way, right? So the idea here was that subject A and subject C both completed some sort of validated, validated test, and subject uh, B and D completed some sort of non-validated test. But there's something about the neuroimaging compared to the behavioral task that people make a distinction on. Um, does anybody want to, anyone that answered both to the, to the last set of questions and didn't answer both to this set of questions want to talk about the difference there? That's okay, you can still talk. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so I said A, and I said A, be, um, I'm a psychologist, um, specialized with kids, work in Concord, and I teach a class at MIT. Um, so I said A because um, the, it's a clear diagnosis, right? And with B, it's, it's sort of, I mean, I think it could potentially do harm, actually. You know, someone just has a predisposition towards depressive thoughts, maybe they're like really enlightened and existential. <laughs> so I don't wanna, you know, kind of over-pathologize that. And I'm also curious, um, I think sometimes in releases, don't we sort of say, like, if there's a diagnostic issue, we would, you know, ask for release to communicate with the actual clinician? So I'm curious um, what your guys' thoughts are about that or how, how often that's happening. Certainly, I guess you could get someone with a diagnosis who doesn't have a psychologist or psychiatrist on board, um, but maybe even, like, primary care, you know. So I'm just curious um, about that. But, yeah, those are my thoughts. Thanks. I mean, I can, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in. I just wanted to say, uh, if you think of the uh, analogy of genetic testing, uh, where you might have uh, a non-validated or, or either uh, a weak association with the disease, you might then want to uh, build into the study, it's resource dependent, of course, but then follow up with a validated study. So that if, if the first these association tests showed some uh, proclivity towards depression, maybe then fo follow it up with a, uh, a more standardized uh, assessment. Right, I, I, I was gonna say the same thing, that actually it's not, it's not just returning the results that's probably important, it's actually the follow-up that I think is the most important. So at McLean, for example, in subject A's case, if you uh, have a neuroimaging finding, it automatically gets read by a radiologist and McLean actually pays for follow-up MRI scans to be done as, for free as part of making sure we're following up correctly on issues like this, basically. Um, and I think a lot of it would be, yeah, well, you know, here's a result, we don't really know what it means, but my obligation to you is to help you find a psychologist, basically, maybe that's actually the obligation. Um, can, can I make one comment? Yeah, uh, so I, I didn't say this earlier, and I, I, I wanna add it now. I think that as people who work in a clinical space, we often have clinical language for everything, but you don't need to necessarily use clinical language to return results. So for example, 
you know, depressive thoughts doesn't have to say, you know, a tendency towards depressive thoughts. It can be something like, you know, uh, a, a tendency towards, you know, concepts associated with sadness or something that's less like the clinical term and more the layperson term for really a very similar phenomenon. And so I think that when returning results, if you want to stay away from the pathologizing of what might be a normal variation, call it by its lay term. And I think that's something that we don't do enough of. So I, I was a both on both of them. Uh, but I, I want to raise my concern, I guess, because uh, I think the, you know, what you brought up earlier about sort of informed consent and, and respect for your participant as two, you know, pillar uh, ethical concerns and having respect for the person and not deciding for them what's, what sort of information they can handle. I think, you know, uh, as clinicians, we're required to have a fiduciary responsibility to patients, right? But again, this is not quite, you know, also there's a lot of companies doing research in this area. And it's like, wh what exactly in that case is their fiduciary responsibility? I mean, they still have to go through IRB. But you know, here's my question is, uh, it's one thing for, you know, Laura and other people who are really good at this, right, and who've thought it through very carefully to return the results using the right language. Uh, my concern on the ethical scale, though, right, is what if everyone did this, right? What if every single study you ever participate in, they would give you a little bit of information, they don't do it particularly well. It, you know, we've all read the psychiatric literature, right? So the moment you start to sort of, you know, you try to help them um, make sense of the finding with your own pet theory of what it might mean, but it's not really, we're not sure yet. I worry that patients are gonna to come to us with like, oh, well, I did this study and I know that I'm prone for the, how do we handle the, just if this becomes the norm, that why wouldn't people come with all kinds of crazy ideas about them, some of which are higher certainty than others? You know, that's my sort of fear. I mean, it's fascinating. I was, I was talking with someone about this yesterday that, I mean, I think that's already happening to some degree, right? So if you talk to um, primary care doctors, uh, they have people walking into their office now on a routine basis, handing them their 23andMe results and saying, well, what does this mean? And the primary care doctor doesn't know what to say because who knows what it means, right? And so, and, and, and as a clinician where, you know, I have, the thing that I get all the time is people coming and bringing their Fitbit data in and say, see, I'm not sleeping. I'm like, okay, I, I know. Like, I didn't sleep last night either. My daughter was up at 2 a.m., but I didn't need a Fitbit to tell me that, you know? So, like, I, there is a certain degree of, like, you get all this data, and we don't actually know what to say or do, and there is a risk. I think one of the risks of returning everything is that it just becomes too much to sort through, basically. Um, I, I don't know if you guys have any. So... I don't quite know how to pose this question, but we've been talking a lot about should we share the data with the subject where the researcher plans the whole study and, you know, the participant comes in and then we do what we had planned. But if you're working with a patient community that has said we want these results shared with us from this research study, I just, I, mean, I don't think we can set up a poll live right now, but I'm just curious, you know, how many people would actually shift their position. Yeah. And if it's the patients themselves are saying we want all the data regardless of whether or not it's you know early stage, um, whether that changes things. Because I think a lot of patient groups would. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think I, I, I think Justin earlier we were talking. You know, the idea that it might help with recruitment actually. I mean, it's, so time for one more. Um, so so I answered uh, A on this one and both on the previous one, and uh, I think with my clinician hat on. Uh, there's a difference in the nature of the data for the second subject in each case, and that rightly, and I, I don't really know the glutamate MRI, but uh, imaging is sort of considered a relatively uh, binary task in that a scan like that, I assume, I, I, I may be wrong, is either positive or negative, and that's, that's information that even, we don't know what it means clinically, but it's a relatively bite-sized piece in that either you have a positive or you don't. And I think that's, uh, that's relatively more objective than a test where I mean, you know, we don't actually ever order just the one test. It's, it's the whole battery. And Laura got to this, that even a test like that, there could be five or six possible uh, explanations. So I think there's, there's exponentially more vagueness, even with the test score being what it is around how to interpret it. I think it's more palatable to give someone a yes or no, and then you may know what it means or not, but the nature of the, the, the datum, I think, matters also. And, and the more complex or the more explanations there could be for it, I think uh, the more work it creates on the clinician and to somehow make sense of it all. 
Thank you. Hi, Scott Roush from McLean Hospital. I wondered if, if you or the panel might just uh, make a finer point about the who, the who shares the information. Because I think there's the PI. The PI might actually be a non-clinician, and then in some ways they may feel more absolved of what it means to place something in a clinical context if at the start they're saying they're a non-clinician, so they're speaking more from a strictly research perspective. Um, you mostly don't want probably an RA, with no offense, um, sharing the findings. And so since context is so important and identity is so important, I'd be curious about your thoughts about who shares the information. That's a great question. Thank you. I, I'm happy to answer. I don't know if you guys want to jump in, but um, I, I think, uh, again, the answer is it depends. Uh, you know, I, I do tend to agree. I, I think it is usually either, it depends on what the data is, basically. So we certainly have uh, research studies, for example, where someone may do some sort of uh, small behavioral task and there, there's a small deception involved where uh, they're told they're going to earn a certain amount of money for a certain amount of performance and that's not actually true. Everyone, everyone gets the full reward at the end. And for something like that, we sometimes would let RAs actually just kind of share that information. Um, but that's just kind of a minor piece of participating in the research study. I think for something of these questions that we're talking about where there's an actual clinical finding, basically we would generally say a clinician probably needs to be involved in that conversation in order to be able to put it in the right context, basically, to be able to talk about the uncertainty, what it does mean, what it doesn't mean, what we know about the data, what we don't know about the data. Um, and so sometimes, as Dr. Rash, as Dr. Rash said, sometimes that could be the PI if the PI is a clinician. If not, it, there may be another clinician on the study who's designated for this. In research studies uh, with genetics, we will often say, uh, if you're going to return genetic results, we require you to have a genetic counselor, basically, on your research staff or that you're coordinating with, and that person is going to be the one who's going to return the results. So, um, so the, it, dep it depends a little bit on the details. Um, so I, I picked A again uh, for this one, and, and sort of I, I'm going to sort of say the, the same thing is this idea of blurring the lines between a clinician and a researcher, and I think we've even done that up here is talking about people as subjects, participants, and also patients in the same sentence, and I, and I think it's really important to clarify these responsibilities and these roles, and I, and I think as, as Benji had talked about, you know, if you have this incidental finding on an MRI, then that's in the consent form. You arrange follow-up, and you make sure that that's clinical follow-up. I think what can be concerning here is that you, you know, you provide these results, like 23andMe, and that's, you know, you get this thing like, well, you know, sorry, pal, you got an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease. And, but there's no, there's no clinical relationship there. And I look at this as sort of the same thing as, you know, sorry, pal, you've got increased risk for depressive thoughts. Even if you have this, you know, a, a results follow-up or things like that, there's no expectation of a longitudinal follow-up. So you're taking those results and you're going to the PCP like, hey, what does this mean for me? So I think for these to clarify who's going to return those results and what's the expectation on follow-up. Because we see, you know, at our hospital we do... Um, trials on, on drugs for Alzheimer's disease, where the participants will then look at the researcher as their primary clinician. But that's not the relationship, and that's not the role, and there is not an expectation of longitudinal follow-up. When the research study ends, they go back into the community, and there's not that expectation. So, you know, I'm not necessarily sure to Dr. Rauch's question who's going to give those results, but I think it needs to be clear, as, as it is oftentimes in, in consents, about what we're going to do with those to make sure that there's appropriate clinical follow-up, because it's not the expectation that the researcher will be your clinician if they are one, you know, wearing a different hat or things like that. And so I, I'm, this idea of therapeutic misconception, which we think about in bioethics, where this line between routine clinical care and routine research gets blurred really to the detriment of participants and, and harm about who is responsible, who has that fiduciary role, and, and how that follow-up is going to be um, pursued. 23andMe has no responsibility. They'll just send you this, and it's like, figure out what you're going to do with it. And I think the concern is not to do that in these situations from an IRB perspective. And just to build off of that, I don't want to try to make a, a summative statement to get everyone to uh, say yes to this, but I could say this. I think probably most of us are in agreement that you need to deliver the results that you promised at the consenting process, right? And so maybe, maybe this is, you know, this is the context you can provide for everything, which is sitting there thinking about your research trial, thinking about which results, you know, basically you have high confidence in, in terms of like this needs interpretation and immediately, like you have a brain mass, 
versus other results where you frankly, you know, don't feel like you actually have an interpretation of the significance simply because it's, you know, basically investigational. You can even imagine a scenario, right, where basically you say, like, here are the results we're going to return. We're going to interpret, you know, a structural MRI so that, you know, if we see an intracranial finding that looks like it needs clinical follow-up, I'm going to tell you you need clinical follow-up. I'm going to arrange it. But for other results, you know, you can imagine the consent that says we will give you your data, but we will not actually give you an interpretation because, you know, even like my SCID, for example, my inter-rater reliability in my lab is eh, not great. I actually don't feel comfortable telling someone who walked in thinking they were a healthy control participant that my RA, who is still training up on the SCID, says you have generalized anxiety disorder. My point just being, you could sit down and make an individual determination. Does your study have the kind of background, have a consensus of literature behind it, and do you have the comfort with the results that you feel like you can take a result and interpret it, or do you feel like a result simply, you're not in a position to interpret it, and then make a decision, yes, I'll return you a CD with your data, but that's, that's the most I can do. I do think, you know, uh, it's important to say what hat you are wearing when you're returning research results, right? So if you are someone who is a clinician and a researcher and you're returning something that's research, making it clear in, in whatever way you can based on the context, based on the way you do it, that I am not telling you this as a clinician. I'm telling you this as someone who is trying to understand this particular phenomenon, this particular measure. We're learning about it, you know, every day. This is my capacity as a researcher. And those roles, I think, are really important for not misleading someone. Let's hear these two, and then I, I want to make sure we have, get to at least one other case. Hi. Um, I think that many of us wrote transparency on that initial slide, um, and I think there's a move towards um, wanting to have more citizen scientists. And I'm an engineer uh, coming to this beautiful psychiatry contracts and learning all of these thoughts. And what I think as an engineer is we want everyone's mind. We don't want just one person looking at a data set and making an evaluation on what to share. We want public data, public analysis, public everything so that everyone can join in this discovery process. And so that's, that's my perspective on sharing. And definitely sharing in a way that is not um, giving the clinical decision um, to scare people. Um, I, I said only subject C, and I'm, I'm not a clinician. I'm a cognitive scientist. And um, I, the thing that I really worry about with sharing a sort of test you can take on your own online or something from any sort of clinical or research point of view is that that normalizes um, tests like this, which certainly have the potential to be very hokey. Um, and so even if the particular non-clinical test that they happen to take in the lab is, you know, semi-validated, even if it's not a, uh, uh, an official clinical instrument, then they get the message from someone who, who is a clinician or is a researcher saying, you know, tests like this, these are, these are potentially meaningful, even if you present it in non-clinical language. And then it's very easy to go out and say, oh, I'm going to take an IAT on the internet. And, oh my gosh, it turns out I'm actually racist. Or it turns out I'm, you know, and, and, and I think that that can be actually very destructive for people who, who don't have any sort of clinical or something related training um, because then all of a sudden this opens up this all sorts of doors for kind of self, self diagnoses and self, um, you know, going off the rails of I have all of these things. Thank you. So um, I didn't know how active and talkative people were going to be. So I, we have more cases than we can get through. So I'm going to just skip ahead, actually, if my computer cooperates. Which is great. I mean, it's good that people get to. Um, so the, the second case was about de-identification and the, 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 um, the, uh, the one liner on de-identification de is we, we often hear from people, well, I'm going to uh, manage confidentiality and privacy issues by just de-identifying everything. And I personally think that is... Um, often impossible, basically. And so I encourage people, I'm happy to talk more about it offline, but I encourage people to be very, very thoughtful about what you're collecting and 
how you're removing it, where the data sits, and who owns it, and what's being linked. Um, but let's let's jump to a question about suicide because I think this came up. Uh, this may have come up yesterday, and uh, so this is a case a research team that is studying risk factors for suicide using mobile phone-based surveys to ask subjects about activity level, mood, thoughts of self-harm and suicide. Recruited subjects are adults, 18 to 45, with a history of depression but no previous suicide attempts. Uh, surveys are sent automatically to participants' phones six times per day between 9 a.m. and 9 p.m., approximately take about three minutes to complete. Um, and so the survey questions include uh, Please rate your mood, scale of 1 to 10. They ask about whether you've engaged in physical activity in the last 30 minutes, and they ask if you're having any thoughts about wanting to end your life right now. And so the question is, what is our obligation to monitor that suicidality question? Um, and so there's a bunch of different responses here. I couldn't capture all of them, but I'm curious to see what people think, and I hope that the phone's updated OK after skipping through all those slides. Um, so not required to monitor, required to monitor in real time. I, I note that I put 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., but you know these things often happen in the middle of the night. Required to monitor or respond within 24 hours, within one week. Not requi uh, required to provide referral responses, but not to respond directly. You're not allowed to ask this question in this way, uh, or something else. Um, yeah, please. Oh, go back to the question, I'm sorry. So, uh, so the question is, are you having thoughts about wanting to end your life right now? And the survey question is basically, how are you, how are you supposed to monitor that? Does the panel want to weigh in? No. <laughs> so, I, I, looking for guidance. <laughs> Really? <laughs> well, I, I just just to validate the feelings of the entire panel here that it's a terrifying uh, it's a, it's a terrifying thing. Um, it's a terrifying decision to have to make and think about the implications, both for you know having a study where you it's especially if you have a large sample where it's it, it becomes extremely resource intensive. But then to omit the question now feels like you're you're omitting something really important. But then to include the question, it's just it's it's one of those situations where there's no like there's no easy. I mean. That's why these are here. Yeah. But there's no easy right. answer. Right. I think the, the the thing before about scientific value that I think we know at this point there is huge scientific value in studying suicide, right. right? And so, how do you how do you study it if you don't ask about it? I think if you ask, you could you have to rule out A for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think also that there may be some combinations that would be built into your answer, so that yeah, you you would uh, monitor and respond but you might also have referral resources. And I think one of the concerns is, is certainly with the, the choice F is not allowed to ask the question this way. And you know, the, the IRBs review the language and, and the response, which I think will come up on the, on the panel. I think the concern you know, from a clinical perspective is, you know, as we talked about, if you sort of talk about how information will be used in a consent form, if you say that you are you know, having suicidal thoughts right now, this is what will happen, would that actually deter somebody from actually answering that? So somebody who is whatever the population of this study, you know, depressed, suicidal, and then you sort of create a thing, well, if I answer this and an ambulance shows up at my house and takes me to the emergency room or whatever it is, that may actually deter somebody who is at relatively high risk from answering that question in a truthful way that, that could have actually real implications down the line because they don't want that response or, or whatever that is. And we see that clinically all the time is that, you know, people don't want, you know, to be plucked from their house and brought to an emergency room or whatever the response may be that's deemed ethical uh, in that, from that perspective. And just to be clear, like, I think, I don't know what the modal thing that is done by researchers is, but I have a feeling it's actually F. Like, often, if someone's not specifically interested in suicide, you omit the suicide question. So, I, I feel like F is really unpalatable, but that's what often is done, right? Is that right. correct? I, mean, yeah. I think that's why the, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit, but, like, that's why the PHQ-8 exists, right? I right. mean, it's, right. um, the... Well, also, the, the difficulty of, the PA, of that ninth question, that's, you know... Correct. <laughs> Right. The, um, to James's point, and I think part of the, the so we talked a little bit before about I, I, my personal view that informed consent and respect for enrolled subjects are kind of the two major ethical principles that I apply. So informed consent, I think, has so much to do with this. And 
to, to James's point about in clinical work, the way our, our patients respond to those questions has to do with what, how they might expect the answer. I, I always find it fascinating that I often think in clinical work, we don't actually do a great job of consenting people for that either. You know, meaning that like when you start a new relationship with someone, do you really sit down and say, hey, so if you express suicidality, here's what I might do. Or if you tell me, there's, there's these implied assumptions that everyone knows. If you tell me about child abuse, or you tell me about elder abuse, I'm going to report these things. But I would be willing to bet that if you went and you were a fly on the wall in, in office clinician offices across the country, that most of the time that is not an upfront contract that we actually really explicitly state. The difference in research studies is we do a much better job at actually explicitly stating everything that we need to do because of independent review and, and reviewing consent forms and things of this nature. But it, the consent part is it's fascinating. Let's see. I'm, I'm very curious to see what people think. So 40% required to monitor, respond in real time. How many of those people are PIs? <laughs> um, uh, yeah. It's interesting. The second one is E, though. So it's, it's not, you know, it's either yeah. all in or... or all in kind of. or, right. So E, and, and again, I, I appreciate that the, the devil in the details of these questions and the cases, it's, you know, there's a lot of interpretation. But what I meant by E was basically you don't have to respond, but it should, you know, it, the pop-up window should come up that says call 911, go to your nearest emergency room, here's the suicide hotline, phone number, things like that, that um, there should be something, basically, but, but maybe we don't actually have to respond directly to it. Um, I'm curious, what is the audience, does people want to comment on why they chose what they chose? I'd like to hear a real-time person. A real-time person? Yeah. I'm, there's a lot of them. Hi, Saib Khalsa from the Lawyer Institute for Brain Research. So um, we're part of the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study, which is a study of 10,000 kids, 9 to 10, longitudinal over 10 years. In real time, we get reports uh, about children who have suicidal ideation or child abuse um, concerns uh, at, that are raised. And so, you know, you have to be able to respond to those things in real time. I, I think that in this particular scenario, the value of the information that's being gained it's focused on an incredibly important topic for mental health. So, of course, if you're going to, I mean, clinically, if you ask about suicide, we, right, we understand that asking the question doesn't increase suicidality per se. Um, but I think you, you, if you're interested in that, you have an obligation to provide a response that's adequate to the level of what's raised. So if somebody says, you know, I'm suicidal, I have a knife, uh, you know, to my throat right now, that's very different than something like I have, you know, thoughts about maybe life isn't worth living, right? So I think kind of in some ways um, the type of population that you're studying, the nature of the complaint, a graded response um, can be really um, useful here. Um, I liked uh, Matt Knox's approach and we'll see whether that app, you know, in terms of providing information about, well, you know, in real time using an automated fashion, this is the kind of concern, this is the information, you know, if you call a suicide hotline, an ambulance isn't going to, you know, or, or police aren't going to show up at your home. Um, I think that uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, you really, it, it depends really does matter, but we, we have an obligation if we're going to ask these questions, you know, to, to really provide a graded response. Thank you. I, I do think you, um, you, you read my mind in terms of some of the slides in that the, the study population, you know, so I think dealing with adults versus adolescents might be different. And so I, I can tell you, this came up fairly recently for me that, uh, you know, Children's Hospital IRB would not allow uh, uh, a non-response, basically, that they're, you know, that in dealing with children, um, they're going to require a real-time response, basically, which, you know, I, I should say for the modal, you know, the, the conversation of, like, what do we allow, what do we see, the, the short answer is we see all of the above, basically, and, and we do have studies that ask about suicide and don't have real-time response, and we do have studies that ask about suicide and have real-time response, and we have studies that have pop-ups, and we have studies that say we'll monitor, we're going to respond, you know, as, as Robert said, with a tiered approach where, you know, this answer will be within 24 hours, this answer will be within a week, you know, et cetera. And again, to James's point about consent, and we tell people up front kind of what that, that means. So, so, so people do everything all over the map, and I, th I think the point about study population is an important one.
So I think that kind of took one of the points I was going to say, which is that having thoughts of suicide can mean very different things, which I think is very relevant here, that that can mean anything from, I've had some thoughts, maybe I've had them before, I know how to cope with them, I'll be okay, or it can mean, I am suicidal, I have a plan, I have the means, I want to do this today. And those require very different things. And so I chose other because I'm not actually sure what obligation I think a researcher has to provide a response, but I think that if they are choosing to provide a response, they do have the obligation to do that right. And that means not responding to the person who has perhaps passive suicidal ideation in the same way you respond to someone who is at imminent risk in that very moment. And I think by, if you're going to collect that information with the idea that you might respond to it and intervene, once you're putting yourself in the role of providing care for that person, you have an obligation to do it effectively and to do it appropriately. Thank you. Could I, <clears throat> just, just to riff off that comment, I mean, let me pose a hypothetical. Can you imagine, so a consent process, right, where basically it's part of the consent is, we're going to ask you questions about self-harm and then it says we're going to ask you at you know x frequency you know a couple times a day random times and then the consent process also says here's what we're going to do you know if you say yes right so if you say yes and you know again it, there's like i guess like a fractal of different options that comes after that but if you say yes and we don't hear a response you know after that for follow up we're going to you know call EMS if you say yes and we follow up and we're not clear if this is a change than X, Y, or Z. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't feel like I usually see consent processes that basically describe responses to things that happen in that level of detail. I mean, from an IRB perspective, like what would you think about seeing that? You and should submit some protocols to our IRB and you'll get that feedback. Tomorrow. Um, yeah, no, that's what we require, basically. So we require explicit language that would say this is exactly this is exactly what's going to happen and, and exactly what we are going to respond to and exactly what we are not going to respond to. So, you know, we commonly will include language that says something like, you know, this is not for uh, telling us about clinical concerns. This is not for telling us about emergencies. You know, it doesn't mean people won't do it. And there's still this question of if you, you know, I think that's the philosophical question, basically, is if you give someone, if, if you get true informed consent, which we could talk about what that means, and you tell someone, we are not going to be monitoring this question, and then they say they're suicidal, and something happens, is that okay? You know, like, it, you know, and so that, that's, that's ultimately the issue. And, um, and so people that say that's not okay would say, well, you just can't ask the question then, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think... For me, the context here is um, suicide research is one of these third rails that has been really hard to study. We all know the statistics that they, they haven't changed. If anything, they've gone up. Uh, and so I guess I'm curious what the panel thinks about, you know, are we, you know, we're sort of making a very clear distinction here between research-related ethics and, and clinical ethics. And you made the point that, gosh, there's huge variance in the consent process of a relationship. There's nothing done to document exactly how we would sort of protocolize the clinical suicide evaluations, right? And I think one of the reasons we're all here is that we're very interested in how do you scale high quality mental health care, right? And it obviously has to be done in concert with the research process. But I'm just curious, you know, the, it seems like this is a problem which we've failed to address because presumably it's hard for people to get their head around, ask the question, and it's hard to kind of uh, do it perfectly so people stay away from it. Um, and it just seems like from a bird's eye view, it, you know, we clearly need to sort of dig in deeper and actually like ask the hard questions and cope with the responses, even if that means that in some cases we're putting our participants at risk. Um, and it just seems like, you know, to sort of say, well, it's the doctor has this role, so we can kind of do it. But most doctors aren't doing it well. So I think, how do you guys think about that? I, I do think we think, you know, we talk a lot about risk, but thinking deeply about the benefit side of the equation. You can imagine if it was, um, the burden of proof was on showing why you shouldn't ask about suicide and it's not from a risk perspective or from a it's not relevant perspective. And we had protocols that were standardized 
for triaging people in remote and in-person assessments of suicide. And let's go further, I'm not suggesting we should do this, but let's go further and say, what if NIMH says, and if any funded study on mental health has to ask about suicide? Like that would be, I mean, it would be horrific for a little bit as we all have to adjust our protocols and figure out how to make it work, but that would probably actually lead to a lot of new knowledge. Well, I mean, the FDA basically does. So most investigational drug studies, even if we don't think they're going to have much signal in that way, they'll say, well, why, don't you, why aren't you asking about suicide? I mean, it's common we see that to happen. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so a few thoughts. First one is, so if we're looking at this, the severity, right, the idea of the question that asks you, are you imminently about to commit suicide, is probably not one that is all that useful for research anyway, because you're trying usually to understand if that is going to happen. If you're already at that point, you've kind of missed the boat. So outside of the questions where you're talking about, are you imminently going to commit suicide right now, which there's a strong argument for intervention, I would say for things before that, when it's talking about ideation, which is the most commonly thing asked, we have to also be humble and remember clinical equipoise. We don't actually have evidence-based, well-validated interventions that we know will be effective for everybody if they say they have suicidal ideations. We might be doing more harm than good. So clinical equipoise is, a very, is the cornerstone of why clinical research is okay to begin with. And I think that if we just remember that, the point is we don't know what to do. And this research is supposed to teach us about that. Um, so I, I would have answered E, and that's what we're doing in our protocols. Uh, we give a disclaimer up front saying you're using the app. There's going to be the PHQ-9. The, the ethics committee has accepted this. Um, here are the resources you should go to if you're suicidal. No one's going to be checking this uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, but because we don't know. If we, if we start intervening directly, firstly, we're, we're, we're messing with the data, so we're ruining the thing we're out there to learn to begin with. Um, secondly, so that, then there's no point in doing the study at all. Uh, wh why bother? Um, then, then we don't know what the right intervention is. Because even with like, the best suicide programs, it's not like we have a, a slam dunk there. So I think clinical equipoise keeps us humble, um, and it's there, and we should respect it so that we can actually develop the right interventions to not have to worry about this answer to this question in the future, because we'll know what to do, but we don't know yet. Thank you. That's a great point. Um, maybe, oh yeah, go ahead. I, I actually want to change the subject, so if we're ready to move on, and I was sure, wondering yeah, if I, I could bring up the, something. So the next couple questions are just slight, asking slightly different ways about suicide, but I'm totally open to other questions. Thank you. So I think a lot about the data that already exists in electronic health record and how we increasingly want to use those data for observational research in a learning health system kind of way. Um, and, and those are data that typically a patient has not, a patient has not consented specifically for the use of their data in that way. Um, I know, and you, you mentioned, Benji, that, you know, IRB thinks about risk for harm versus risk for benefit, you know, which one outweighs the other. The HIPAA privacy rule allows that if you lay out, you know, treatment, payment, and operations, um, that research is covered, you know, from, from the HIPAA privacy rule perspective. Um, but I'm wondering the panel's thoughts on, on do we think that, you know, there's a lot in the, in the media about people are increasingly aware of the way that their information is being used, whether it be Facebook or otherwise. And I think we're a little bit changing our social contract in thinking about how observational information can be used. I don't get the sense it's changing in IRBs yet from conversations I've had. Don and I, actually a colleague, Don Sugarman and I are on a project talking with IRBs um, relate, about related subjects. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering, now I think of, for example, natural language processing. It's really hard. You mentioned de-identification. Let's not, let's not fool ourselves that it's, you know, that it's foolproof by any stretch. And things like natural language processing really can get into very private moments of patients' health care. So I just wanted to perhaps you know, hear from the panel as well as the audience whether you think, is our social contract changing and how we think about how these data can or should be used that's, that's different than how perhaps we've traditionally thought about it from a potential benefit to society and, and you know, balancing potential harm to a patient. Thank you. Thank you. So one interesting thing that I, I have been hearing over the last few years in talking about um, sharing of data is that up to this point, we've always been talking about, you know, who, who should the data be shared with? So, you know, consent to share with the researcher, and then what if it gets shared to an open data repository? What, what should be included in that? What can't be included in that? With the idea that maybe the participant can have levels of consent, where it's like, I consent to share with only the researcher or with a broader community of researchers. But there's almost never an option that you must share. 
right? So the option that I do not want this just in one lab or one study. I want this data put out into the world so that other people with you know, my disease or my condition or my circumstances um, in the future can be helped by a broader community. And it's an interesting question. When I first saw that in a conference, I was sort of like, oh, wow, I'd, I'd never, ever thought about that. But I think we're in a place now where you know, the, the discussion around sharing isn't just around privacy. It's around what is the participants, why are they doing this, and how do they want to benefit the world? So anyway, I thought that was a interesting. Thank point. you. Other thoughts from the panel on that one? I mean, I, I, um, I think I probably know the, the project you're talking about. I mean, I, there's lots of different places my mind can go with this one. You know, I think that um, I, the short answer is I think that I think our social contract probably is changing. Um, and I think that it's our obligation to let people know about it, basically. I mean, and to me, it's a lot of it is about education, basically. And, you know, when I think about consent in the, 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 the spectrum of, of digital uh, psychiatry, digital medicine, I think about, so, okay, so you're going to have somebody consent to something that is uh, going to be tracking data from their phone, right? And we know that that's already happening, right? All of us are walking around with phones right now that are tracking all kinds of stuff about us. And we probably agreed to that in the terms of service that none of us actually read. And so it's happening anyway, right? And so the question that I always ask is, so when you go to consent someone for your study, do you have to actually go through that? Like, do you have to do the education to get them up to the point where they actually understand what's already happening in their life, basically? Um, because most people are, yeah, I think we're getting better at it, and there's, and there's also generational and age things that come into play, and, you know, but the question of like how much education do you have to get to before you can even get into the consent for that particular study, basically. And I think it's, it's a similar thing where, you know, you and I both know that, yeah, a lot of data from all of the hospitals gets used for research purposes. And yes, if you go read the HIPAA privacy statement that every single person gets, it says we might use your data for research. We get complaints at the IRB all the time about how did this person get my name? How did this person get my contact information? And we're often saying, well, we're going to refer you back to this HIPAA privacy statement that you signed and we know you got. And, you know, but the problem is we don't do a great job educating people, I think, up front. And so I think that I think our social contract just in general with our data, you know, the, the, just the amount of data, I think I read something, you know, 90% of the data in the world has been created in the last two years or something like that. And so it's like this is exponential growth of data. So that's happening whether we like it or not, right? So that, so in some ways the social contract's changing whether we like it or not. And then it's just a question of like how do we keep up with it, you know? And again, this is where I go back to the, the idea of I don't think we can actually. Like I don't think that we're going to be able to devise the rules up front about how to handle it all. I think all we can do is go back to our basic ethical principles and say, okay, so what are the best ethical principles here? It's educating people and trying to get them to consent in the best way that we know how and actually taking the time to try to educate people. So I, I, I'm, I don't know if that answers the question or not, but that's kind of the way I think about it. Um, but yeah, please. You're saying where they don't have to give us permission, where we just automatically use the data. Is no, that I mean the opposite? Got it. Yeah. I, I don't know. You know, the, the, the example that I think about is, um, so this came up, and I think you guys are actually involved in this, so you know, but the recruitment question about, so we have very, very, very strict rules about how you can approach subjects, uh, patients in our hospitals to be, potential research subjects, and we are ultra conservative about it compared, compared to other institutions across the country, and there's a reason for that, and we, you know, I'm happy to talk more about that, but the question became one of just like, should we just kind of open the gates and let people just kind of approach people in a more open way, um, and, and, and there's a lot of advantages that could have. The, the example that came to my mind that I think is related to some of this is, you know, so, so we are teaching teaching institutions, right? So if you go to our hospitals and you're seeing your physician, there may be a resident there and there may be a student there. And there's always this question of, are you allowed to say no to that? Are you allowed to basically say, I don't want any 
residents involved in my care. I don't want any fellows involved in my care. I don't want any students involved in my care. Uh, and how do you handle that? And, and, it's a, and it's a very complicated question, but you know, one of the possible answers is, is no, that we are an academic medical center and part of our mission is teaching the next generation of physicians and so this is required basically. And, and I think the question about research data is the same, which is if this is part of our mission and we do research, are we just going, we're going to use all of your data, we're going to approach you about research studies and, and that's part of receiving care at our hospitals basically. I, I could it yeah, please. Po pose a little bit of, I don't know if I'd call it a hypothetical, but, but to tie together some of those points about how to, bringing uh, participants up to speed about what's already happening. You know, I can imagine writing a, um, a consent where basically it's written to normalize everything we're going to do in the study in the context of what's happening already, right? So, I get, you know, we're going to install BWE on your phone. It's going to track your location just like Google Maps does. And we're going to basically, we're going to analyze basically how often you, you know, click on these ads just like Instagram. So I can imagine, you know, in, in some ways, I can imagine writing something that like, how to put this, uh, maybe accurately normalizes, right? But then you run into this territory, and I don't know if I'm posing this as an official question to IRB members, but, you know, I can imagine writing a consent that really normalizes these things all in the context of something that's happening yet pervasively, which maybe isn't okay, you know what I mean? Which maybe actually wouldn't meet like, you know, basically, well, actually we know doesn't meet like IRB standards for, you know, human participant interaction. But I could, you know, I could phrase things in that way to make like everything we do, like, you know, wow, this is just like, you know, this is what happens on days in and why. Like, you know, it's always going on. We're just gonna do something more scientifically, you know, focused with it. I just wanted to add to, to Elisa's point is it's interesting that the assumption is that you opt in. I think it's always when you look at what the default is in trying to understand how it got to be that point is, you know, maybe in these sort of instances, research is kind of ahead of the curve about the ability to opt out. And maybe as you frame this more with folks, well, Instagram does this, Google Maps does that. Maybe people look at that, well, can I turn that off? You know, those sorts of things. And so it's, it's interesting about, you know, what is our default, how it got to be that. And as we get more information on that, you know, do we actually have more power? power over that with opting out, uh, as opposed to the assumption. Maybe the assumption is that everybody opts out, and that if you want to opt in, then that's up to you, and maybe that's how social media and these things will evolve. I, I'm not sure where these things go, but just to sort of think about how the default got to be there in the first place, um, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, if I could just make one quick follow-up on that. So I think, as you're talking about, you know, ways to relate this to Instagram and other things that people are exposed to, which are behavioral tools, really, you know, uh, that are we're using in a non-health context, uh, we often get asked, you know, when you start a new app, is it okay to use my data to build the system better, right? I mean, that's a common opt-in, opt-out, and I think terms and conditions, you know, I, I don't know how they've evolved legally uh, in terms of the business of software and, and that, but, you know, nowadays there's like one or two high-level things, which is like, do you want me to bug you with a bunch of notifications and add you to email list? And like, is it okay if I use your, your data to help you know, the system learn. Uh, and I just think like, why not just have that be a standard default question when someone enters care, right? It's like, how, what's your level of how much you want me to bug me when stuff's going wrong? And, and do you want to use these, my personal data just for me? Or, or is it gonna somehow inform the, the rest of what you're doing? And I think, right, we're sort of used to this kind of like brick and mortar, we're an academic hospital and therefore you have to do it this way. But I mean, you know, we're talking about moving things to the cloud, right? So like, why not have a more lim lim a nimble system that could respect people's preferences? Um, so I wanted to go back to our discussion of suicide pre prevention for just a second. Someone very close to us um, commit suicide recently and the family, everyone um, in the community pulled together and was just devastated and are devastated. Um, and I think that people surrounding someone who's just committed suicide want to do something so that this can never happen again. Um, so what I'm wondering about is sort of two parts to it. Um, is there a way that people who are close to that family member can opt in with the Medi medical record data and data that's been collected on that person in order to do sort of a retrospective analysis in order to be 
um, able to gather sort of more of a predictive model based on the data that exists, um, and also just when someone dies, just because I don't know, what is the um, relationship to data? Can you still do studies? What, uh, how is that handled? Yeah, that's a great question. And the, you know, medical confidentiality or medical privacy persists past death, basically, is what we'd say. So um, if you're seeing someone in therapy and you learn some certain details and then their family asks you about details, you actually can't, um, you know, just kind of like share details that people might not know. And there's reasons for that. And it's certainly a, a conversation that is nuanced and complicated to say the least. I think the interesting thing is because of the way we do research, most of that, you know, if, if this, if someone who dies via suicide has been getting care at one of our academic medical centers, chances are their data is included in research because of kind of the conversation we just had that, you know, often de-identified data for medical records and things is included. Um, but it, I think it, it would be, um, it'd be challenging, I think, to like request the record and use it in a specific way, potentially. Um, you know, there's, there's nuances to this conversation. We don't talk a lot about research advanced directives or surrogate decision making in research is, um, you know, it's challenging because we, we, do, we, we do bad enough with surrogate decision making in clinical care that, um, you know, it's rare that people would say, yeah, I've really had a conversation with my family members about like which research study I'd want to be enrolled in. You know, it's, um, I don't know, James, if you want to, if you want to. Yeah, I mean, I think just the idea about uh, research with people with diminished capacity or, or however we want to frame that, you know, with children or, you know, in, in my area of people with cognitive impairment or dementia, and it's, it's usually not. And I think that this is one of the things, at least for, for older adults, is that there isn't this menu of advanced directives that say, I want this, I want that, you know, outside of just basic stuff like, do you want to be resuscitated? Do you want to be intubated? It's, you know, so lots of times surrogates are in the position to try to think, you know, maybe they talked about that. There's an altruistic streak for their loved one who's not able to consent, you know, maybe able to provide assent. Um, but it's, it's interesting. It's, it's a lot of backtracking, thinking about measuring these risks and benefits and, and things like that. But it's, it's complicated and, and it's hard to regulate from an IRB, although we certainly try for the protection of a, obviously a very vulnerable uh, potential participant. Thank you. So um, I've had the opportunity to practice psychiatry in two different continents, one of them in two different countries. One of them is Israel and one of them is the US. And in Israel, the whole approach for uh, suicide is different. Uh, you have the right to uh, uh, kill yourself. Uh, maybe not from a religious perspective, uh, but if you're not psychotic, uh, you're allowed to do it. And so I think there's a cultural uh, piece here that uh, we need to think about ethically. If somebody chooses to take their own life, um, maybe they don't want their information shared. Maybe they don't want their, um, uh, uh, what led to their suicide shared with other people, even if relatives want to um, share this information. Um, and I think it's a great idea to have advanced directives to, to something like that. Thank you. Uh, I agree the cultural context is important and it's, um it's interesting to think when we think about the digital psychiatry realm and when we're talking about asking questions online and things, one of the things that comes up for IRBs is often kind of like people are going to be answering these questions from all over the world potentially and how do you actually handle that and do you restrict it to certain countries and not and things like that. So I know we're at time. I just want to end with one quick anecdote that this slide reminds me of. So when I first started doing... Um, work in digital psychiatry, one of the things we were grappling with a little bit was uh, kind of communication with patients and boundaries around uh, are you allowed to uh, search for patients online, should you be interacting with patients on social media, things like this. And it was all about boundaries for communication with patients. And I was sharing this with one of my, uh, one of my wonderful mentors, uh, Dr. Maltzberger, who um, reminded me of the time that he got his first cell phone, uh, his first uh, telephone line in his office. And he reminded me of the time that at McLean, there was just a central phone number that basically people would call and the, the operator would have, you know, physicians' home phone numbers, basically, and could kind of, you know, call the physicians at home and potentially patch them through. And then, and then at some point, 
everyone got their own office line and this was like this big thing and you know and then it's a question of like well how often are you checking that voicemail and what's your obligation for checking that voicemail and how quickly do you have to respond to those voicemails and and in that moment I, as we were talking I realized that you know yeah the technology changes but the questions actually are the same and the basic ethical principles end up being the same around how, do, how we're going to draw the boundaries about email and how we're going to draw the boundaries about the cell phone in my pocket going off with emails and how we're going to draw the boundaries on social media and how we're going to draw the boundaries on how we use people's data and all of this. You know, the, the, the basic principles, I think, remain the same and it's how we apply those principles. And so I appreciate you guys uh, thinking with me about some of those questions, thinking with us about some of those questions today. Thanks for being interactive and um, I appreciate uh, everyone's participation.